just have to fight through the, the weightiness that the enemy wants to put on your praise. Did you all hear me? Sometimes you just have to fight through the heaviness and the weightiness. I felt the enemy wanted to put resistance on our praise. Did anyone else feel that resistance this morning to just enter into his holy of holies? Sometimes you just got to fight through because he's been so good to us. Has he been good to anyone else? He's been so good to us. In spite of everything we see, God is a faithful God. And I stand to you here as a witness of his power. Stand to you here as a witness of his faithfulness. How dare me come into this place and not just say thank you, God. Because when I look around, it, it, it looks like he's been good to you all, too. And he, he woke us up. You know how the saints used to say it. He, he woke us up this morning, and he started us on our way. Everybody didn't get up today. So I'm grateful. I'm so grateful to God. And I just thank God for what he's doing in my life. Amen. I thank God that he's continuing to transform my life into his image. I don't know about you, but I thank God that I'm a work in progress and that God hasn't given up on me and that he's continuing to complete that work that he's begun in me. Is anyone else in here excited about what God is doing? And so we just honor you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you for your presence in this place today because you are here, God. And so we honor your presence. We kiss unto you, God. We thank you, God. Even though in life sometimes we don't understand everything that you're doing, God, we give you the praise because we understand that you are a sovereign God, that you are a providential God. And so... We just continue to submit to your process, God. We allow you to do what you need to do in our lives so that you can use us for your kingdom, God, for your purpose, God. And I pray right now, God, that everything that flows from my heart, everything that expels out of my mouth today be acceptable in your sight, God. You are my strength. You are my redeemer, God. Touch those that labor with us that are sick today, God. Those in the hospital room, God, we thank you for your healing power, God. And even those that are mourning, those that, are, that we've lost, God, we thank you for your peace. We thank you for your comfort today, God. We love you, we honor you, we praise your name. Amen. Amen. Thank God for being here today. I'm, I'm excited to... Uh, share God's word with you all and just always excited to be before God's people and to be a servant and to, are we releasing our young people have they already been released we good so we say welcome to you all that are with us today we say welcome to our online audience we thank you for joining with us today God is so good we're going to be discussing how to be prepared today and so I'm excited to share um, the good news of what it means to be prepared for that thing that God has called us to. And so uh, I'm glad, glad to be here. I didn't sleep well last night, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, my wife is away. She was at a wedding this weekend, and I just don't sleep good when my wife is not in the bed with me. We've been hanging out and sleeping together for 25 years, and I'm used to just putting my hand over on her or and sometimes when I snore, she'll go to the other side of the bed, and then instead of us being face-to-face, -face, we'll be feet-to-face. And um, But when she's not in the bed, it seems like there's noises in the house. It's just I didn't sleep well last night. So you all pray for me today. And um, also I want to just uh, for our co-pastors today, let's give our co-pastors, Pastor Safan and Desma Bell, a, a hand clap of praise today. We thank them. I just want you to... 
lift your hands toward them. We're going to just say a word of prayer because those Crimson Tide didn't make it through the night last night. And so uh, we're supposed to be praying for them right now. We're supposed to be supporting our pastors and their loss. So we want to be supportive. That didn't seem like support. That seemed, that seemed more like some haterism that was going on. I wanted us to support our co-pastors and their loss. So I can't talk. I'm an Oklahoma Sooners fan, and it's just a matter of time that we'll be joining that L column. We just thank you all. We're going to be reading today. The, the title of our sermon today is Preparation Pays. Preparation Pays. Oh, I see somebody like going to like it today. Preparation Pays. We're going to be reading from Genesis 6 today. We're going to be looking at the life of Noah. And so I want to say this to you, and I want you to look around. Just look around the room. Look at where you're sitting. Look at where you were yesterday. Look at where you're going to be to, to later today. Look at where you're going to be tomorrow and what your week will look like. And what I want to say to you is you're doing exactly what you plan to do in life. Whatever it is that you're doing right now, whatever job you're on, whatever place in life you are in right now, you're doing exactly what you planned and prepared to do. You're doing exactly. If you're not doing anything, you're doing what you plan to do. We're doing exactly what we plan to do. Let's read. So the Lord said, this is uh, Genesis 6. We're going to read at the seventh verse. I typically read from the New King James Version. If you have it in your Bible's turn, we're going to also have it on the screens. And it reads, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. Watch this, though. Watch this eighth verse. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know if I'm getting a little reverb on my microphone. Is it just me? It's okay. All right. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth, I may have pronounced that wrong. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubic from above and set the door of the ark inside, in its side. You shall make it with lower second and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every of the, and of the every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sorts to the ark to keep them alive with you. They should be male and female, the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth is kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. They will come to you <laughs> to keep them alive, and you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and shall gather it for yourself, and ye shall be food shall be food for you and for them. Watch this 22nd verse. It says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. I'm just going to use my handheld today, if that's all right. I am getting a little feedback. So uh, today we're going to be talking about preparation pays. Preparation pays. So we saw in that particular passage, and we're going to read. We're 
we're going to read it. And so first, let's look at the, the definition of preparation so that we can clearly understand what it means. So the definition of preparation, and I want us to listen closely to these words. So the definition of preparation is the action or process of making ready. Let's, let's see what we have in there. The action, process of making ready ready. Anything that you accomplish in life, anything that you're going to achieve in life, there's going to need to be a process. There's going to need to be kinetic energy. There's going to need to be action. And so we see the word process. I wanted to just drill down on that. So we have the definition of process also. The definition of process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to, to achieve a particular in. So not just one action, there's going to be a series of actions. There's going to be a process. There's going to be structure in place for us to achieve anything. If you're working on anything, anything that God has set on your table to do, there's going to need to be a process. There's going to need to be actions. There's going to need to be movement. There's going to need to be steps that we take. And so then we saw the word action in the definition of preparation. We saw action in the definition of of the word process. So let's see what the definition of action is. The definition of action is to do. To do something to achieve an aim. To do. So we saw actions. We saw actions. We saw steps. We saw a process. We see to do. We see movement. You can't achieve anything. I don't care what you're working on. In life, you can't achieve anything by doing nothing. According to preparing ourselves and achieving a goal, we have to be doing something. We have to have steps in place. We have to have a process. We have to have structure. Because that's how we were created. When God created us, talking about us, mankind, he created us to solve a problem. Right? We were placed here on earth to, to, to solve a dilemma. There was a crisis that God had you and I in mind for. There was a dilemma. There was a dysfunction. Remember when Jesus came to the earth? He came here to solve a crisis. He, he came here to remedy a wrong. No different than us. When we were created, we were created to solve a dilemma. We were either created to solve a dilemma, fulfill God's purpose, or demonstrate heaven on earth. That's right. God put us here on earth, you and I, in his image so we could demonstrate what heaven looked like here on earth. And that was going to be a problem. And so God knew that we would need a process. There would be problems. There would be a crisis. There would be a dilemma. There would be dysfunction. And here we see in our passage, we see dysfunction. We see, we see debauchery. God is so displeased, so disgusted with who? With mankind. We're operating in incest. You got the giants having sex. You got all types of things. Some, some of the historians suggest fallen angels. Just complete adultery, wickedness, violence. The earth had just completely done away with itself. And God is saying, I'm so sorry that I even made mankind. As a matter of fact, he said in the scripture, my spirit will not contend with humans forever. So he's just prepared to wipe out all of mankind. There's the problem. There's the dysfunction. And so when we talk about preparation, if anyone have ever studied the fact that we need to prepare, and if you study preparation, I don't care what manual you look in, there's going to be one step that they're going to ask you to start with. Anytime you prepare, they're going to say you need a plan, right? They're going to say you need a big, if you're going to start a business, they say you need a what? A business plan. You're going to start a 501c, a nonprofit. You're going to need a plan. Why do you need a plan? Because you're wanting to put something in place. You want to write the vision out so that you can solve a problem. We create businesses because we believe we have an end to a mean. We want to solve a problem and we want to be compensated for it. We start our nonprofits because we have, believe we have a solution to a crisis, to a dysfunction. But when you really talk about preparing yourself, it doesn't start with the plan. Where does the process start? It starts with trust. It doesn't start with the plan. Mankind tells you that it starts with the plan. It starts with trust. 
We see it in the scripture. The Bible says in verse number 8, it says, God had contended that he was going to do away with man. Verse number 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. For you Bereans, for you scholars, do you realize this is the first ever mentioning of grace in the Bible? This is the first time that we see grace mentioned in the Bible. And it's found with Noah. God is a pleased. The Bible says Noah found grace in his eyes. What God is seeing with his eyes, he's pleased with. And so we have to understand that. We have to understand that before we can even develop a plan, before we can have a plan to solve a problem, before we can make money, before we can start a business, before we can get into our purpose, we have to have a but Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord. And then it goes on to say that Noah was three things. If you want to understand how to have favor with God, there's three things that are mentioned here in the scriptures. Three things. It says he was righteous. It says Noah was blameless. Number two, and I'm going to spend a little time on number three. It says Noah walked faithfully with God. Righteous. You want to have favor with God? If you want to be in on his good side when he's upset with everybody else and everybody else is operating evil, three things that got caught God's attention. He was righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? He was in right standing with God. He operated with integrity. He did the right thing. So he operated in right standing with God and man because it also says that he was blameless. So blameless means that Noah had a good reputation. That means that he had a good reputation with men. That means that, that means that he kept his word with men. You know, that means that he, 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 if he made a commitment with someone, if he told someone he was going to do some, something, if he obligated himself, he kept his word. His word was good with mankind. He was blameless. He was righteous. He was blameless. But he, it also says that he walked faithfully with God. And I got to stay here because we need to understand what it means to walk faithfully with God. That means that you're walking with God. You're here and God is here and you're walking together. That's what it means when it says walk faithfully. Because a lot of times we walk ahead of God. That's not walking faithfully with God. What does that look like? That means that we're trying to do our own thing. We create our own plans. And then we say, God, please bless my plans. And we get all of our prayer partners together and we say, let's pray for this thing. God, pray for this. We, we don't need to pray for it the way we want to pray for some things. If we were walking with God and we were doing what he asked us to do, why do we need to just petition so strongly for God to do something? Maybe it's because we got ahead of ourselves and we got ahead of God. And so we're doing what we want to do and we're asking God to bless something that we didn't involve him in in the first place. That's called walking ahead of God. That's not what the scripture said Noah did. And then there's this thing of walking behind God. Because sometimes God is asking us to do something. He's petitioning us for a plan. He has something in mind for us. There's some dilemma. There's some crises. There's some dysfunction. He said, Rod, I want you to address this. But here I am, and you know what? I don't know if I can do that because I'm just praying. I'm just waiting on God. And so God is walking ahead of us, and he's asking us to do something that we're hemming and hawing with. That's called walking behind God. But the scripture says that Noah walked faithfully with God. Faithfully. That's not a casual relationship. That's not checking in with God and then checking out. Because that's sometimes what we do in our relationships with God. We have this, these seasons with God where sometimes we're walking with him. We're waking up. We're seeking him early. We're, 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 we're consulting God for the decisions that we make. But walking with God means that at all faithfully, that means that everything that I do in my life, I'm going to involve God. Because I care about the relationship that I have with God. And if I care about the relationship that I have with God and I walk with God, then God realizes that he can trust me. He can trust me. Why? Because I walk with him. And sometimes if we walk with God, if we walk with God, then God begins to talk to us. When we walk 
with God, then God begins to talk to us. And it doesn't mean that he's always given us this big revelation. Sometimes us walking with God is God telling you, you know what, you don't need to go to lunch with Sally today because all Sally wants to do is gossip. She's not going to enhance the kingdom. So walking with God means that we're involving him in, with God in everything that we do in our life. But walking with God means that he's talking to us. So when he begins to talk to us, then that means that he's beginning to share his intimate details and his intimate secrets. He say, you know what, I'm not pleased with my people. I'm not pleased with my people, but you have walked with me, so let me let you in on a secret. I'm prepared to destroy everything. And that's what God did with Moses. I'm sorry, Noah. He's sharing his intimate details with him because of the relationship that they have together. Trust. And God taps him on the shoulder. Not because Noah is seeking the hand of God. God taps Noah on the shoulder because he's seeking God's heart. Pre preparing to do anything that God has asked you to do starts with him being able to trust you. Are we righteous? Are we in right standing with God? Are we in right standing with our brothers and sisters? Are we blameless? Are, is our word good? Are we walking with God? God, can God trust us with something big? Y'all looking at me. Can God trust you with something big? Is our relationships a relationship that consists of us being faithful? Or is it a relationship where we check in and we check out? We check back in with God when there's a crisis. And then when everything's okay, we check back out and we do our own thing until we get to the next crisis. And now we're praying fervently. And now we're seeking the heart of God. But God says, I'm pleased with you, Noah, because you have walked faithfully with me. And then it says, now we're ready to develop a plan. So what is the next step in the process? Develop a plan. We don't start with the plan. We start with trust. And us developing trust with God. But the second thing we do is we develop a plan. And guess who develops the plan? God develops. We, we don't have the brilliance to develop the plan. So you got to understand this whole ark idea was not Noah's idea. This was not Noah's idea. No, if, if you understand the time, do you guys realize water had never fallen from the sky at that time? They had never experienced rain. So God's plan won't necessarily make sense, but God wants to do the planning. Hear me on this. God wants to do the planning, and he wants us to do the preparing. And so when we're planning, when we're operating with what God has given us, when he begins to give us instructions, and the only way we're going to understand and have clarity on his instructions is if we're walking closely with God. You know how many times I hear people say, I just don't really, I don't have clarity. You know what that says to me when you say you don't have clarity? That means that you're not walking close enough with God. And if you don't have clarity on the purpose in your life right now, that means you need to get a little closer to God. Because when we get close to God, like Noah did, we understand exactly what he wants us to do. So watch this. I have a picture of the ark. Let's put this on the screen. Watch this. This is a replica of the ark. God goes to Noah and says, I want you to build me an ark. So we're talking about the plan. He says, okay, I want you to make an ark of gopher wood. They really didn't have that term back then. It was mainly cypress. It was the cypress tree. So the clarity and the details means that I don't say, okay, I need to go to Home Depot and get the cypress wood. I'm just going to go over here to Lowe's and get this other wood because it's on sale. Noah had to get the cypress wood for the tree. And Noah didn't have the intellect to know. First of all, Noah didn't have any concept of rain. So that lets us know that we should never think our plan is brilliant enough for God. God always gives us the plan because we're not brilliant enough to understand what God is doing, something that he's going to do a hundred years or so later. This plan that God has Noah working on 
won't be implemented. Some historians say 180 years. I saw some research that said 120 years. Let's say somewhere between 80 and 120 years, God has Noah working on this plan. He tells him to get cypress wood. Why does he need cypress wood instead of regular lumber? What did you say? Cypress wood does not rot easily. So if Noah cuts a corner and goes and gets some regular wood, and when he's in the boat or the ark, if he doesn't completely obey God, then guess what's at stake? What's at stake, saints? Let me help you with that. Let me help you understand what's at stake. Salvation is at stake. God has given Noah the opportunity to save his family. See, understand, anytime you read the scriptures, I don't care what you're reading, it always points back to the life of Jesus Christ. And this is no different than the life of Jesus. There's a sacrifice that has to be made so that humanity can be saved. So what's at stake if Noah doesn't obey God's instructions is the, the well-being and the salvation of his family. So he says, go get me cypress wood because I need cypress wood because it's not going to rot. He says, go get me the pitch. What is the pitch? It's, it's, it's a tar-like substance. And so he wants him to, he says, do it on the inside and the outside of the boat. He says, I want you to make the boat uh, 300, 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubic high. To put that in feet, that's about 500 feet long, 75 feet wide. 45 feet high, we had the boat. And he says that, remember we're talking about preparing because now we're getting ready to prepare ourselves to do something great. And he has to follow these specific instructions. He needs clarity, which means he needs to make sure that his relationship with God is still faithful, that it's still a close relationship. But watch this because we're talking about, remember those words we use? We use the words movement. We use the word actions process. Remember we said do. The action, the, the, the definition of action is to do. Watch this. In verse 22 it says and Noah did. Repeat after me. And Noah did. I don't think y'all get that. Say that again. And Noah did. Repeat this other word after me. Everything. So repeat this word. This side over here. This side was a little louder. Say Everything. And Noah did everything as God commanded. Are you all listening to me? We got the trust. God now is trusting us with something big. Oh, and let me tell you, I missed a step because before you can implement the plan, you plan, you have to make a decision to be obedient. Don't if you're writing that down, write that down. Before the plan is implemented. We have to make a decision to be obedient, guess what, to something that won't make sense. Noah had to decide, okay, God, you're trusting me. God has tapped me on the shoulder to do something great. Now I have to make a decision. Will I obey God? Once we make a decision to obey God, we now have to begin to implement his plan with precision. I need the cypress wood. I need the pitch. I need this, you know, and I need the levels because we got to bring the species in. We got to bring species so that we can eat. We got to bring the, the clean species in so that we can duplicate and continue to have this in society. So he has to implement the plan as God has commanded. And the Bible says, but Noah did everything as God commanded. And so that doesn't mean that we can skip corners. Because sometimes we, if we develop the trust enough to where God wants to share his plan with you, and I believe every one of, of us in here has a plan on our life, right? How many, have, how many has God showed you the plan for your life? At least some elements of it. So guess what you're waiting on now? You're waiting on clarity now. If you're not already in your purpose, you're now waiting on clarity that means you need to get a little closer if you don't fully understand. See, I kind of have an idea what God wants me to do. But as I continue to walk with him, sometimes he adds additional details. But if he doesn't follow these details to the T, his family is not saved. But the Bible says Noah did everything that God commanded him to do. 
And that's what we have to do, saints of God. We can't cut corners when it comes to God. We must obey God to the fullest extent of the letter of the law. So we trust him, or we, we develop trust so that God can tap us on the shoulder. We say, God, yes, I'll do what you ask me to do. We begin to implement the plan because we're talking about preparation pays. Now we've got to practice. We've got to have reps. So our next step after we have the plan, and God has given us a plan, we need practice. This is what Noah did for almost 100 years, was practice every day. He's hammering every day. Every day he pulls out his hammer, saints of God. For 100 years, he's doing the same thing. Do you guys realize that he, for 100 years, hammered for 40 days of rain? 100 or so years, he's hammering for a rain that was only going to take place 40 days. Wasn't that what Jesus did? He prepared for 30 years. Do you understand how the bulk of what we're doing here on earth is the preparation? He prepared for 30 years to do ministry for three years. Don't underestimate the power of the preparation. He hammered our consistency. This is where God develops consistency with us. He's looking for diligence. He doesn't want us taking days off where we say, oh, I'm not going to hammer today because he's given us something big that requires us being diligent. And he says, if you put the hammer down, let me tell you how you put the hammer down if God begins to walk ahead of you. If God is walking ahead of you, you might put the hammer down. If you get ahead of God, you might put the hammer down. But keeping that hammer and nailing those nails into that cypress wood means that every day that I get up, I'm walking faithfully with God because when we don't walk faithfully with God when we put the hammer down when we put the assignment down that means according to the scripture now I'm not saying this about us but that means that we might be lazy did God ask us to put the hammer down God showed you something there should be something to that purpose that you're working on right now. You know what God has asked you to do. Every day are you working on that? Or do some days do we put the hammer down? Let me, let's look at that in the scripture, what it means to put the hammer down. Repeat after me, don't get lazy. Don't get lazy. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 says, go to the ant, you sluggard. That's another word for lazy. Consider her ways and be wise. Which having no captain, overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer, gathers her food in the harvest. This is what we do once we've been given the plan. God is now requiring consistency. Consistency, gathering in the summer. Consider the ant. The ant has so many characteristics. Another characteristic that I'm not here to talk about today, but the ants understand community better than anyone. The ants work together for a purpose, a purpose that's bigger than them. Have you ever noticed an ant is always carrying something larger on their back than they are? Ants carry things on their back that are five or six times their size. And that's what God has given Noah. He's given him a vision that's much larger than he is. But he says to consider the ant because the ant stores. The ant is consistent in the summer, preparing for the winter. And as I look around here, all of you all, skin complexion is about like mine. This is a problem for us, preparing in the summer. How many of us made the financial seminar this morning or it's next week? Preparing in the summer. That's what we talk about with our money. Preparing in the summer. There's a reason that our 401ks and IRAs are not as large as they are right now. Because we don't understand how to prepare in the summer. 
And that's what the ants do. They prepare in an inopportune season for something that's inevitable. Guess what? If, unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to die. Right? And I don't want to offend anyone with the GoFundMe, but anytime I see GoFundMe, what that says to me is that someone didn't prepare in the summer. We're going to die? And at some point, there's going to be a time in your life when you're not going to necessarily be able to go to work. You're going to want to retire. So what does that mean? Unless we do what Noah did, prepared a hundred or so years in advance for a 40-day, or if you add the 150 days that they floated, a 200-day occurrence, he spent most of his time preparing in the summer for something that was going to happen in the winter. And that's what we do in this stage of practice is where we develop consistency. We remain consistent. This is a tough one for us because we as a people are really, really inspirational. We get excited about things initially. We get excited about the plan. We get excited when God shares things with us. No doubt Noah was excited at first, but what about in year two, in year three? And that's what happens in our marriages sometimes. We get excited for the, for the, for the wedding. And we're looking nice and we have nice food. We have our guests. We all look nice. But what about the marriage? What about the consistency that's needed in the marriage? What about the hammering in the marriage? Are we hammering every day in our marriage to make sure that we can fulfill the purpose or we continue to walk closely with God in our marriages so that we can continue to have the success and the excitement because sometimes the excitement wears off. The excitement of the vision when God gave it to us initially wears off. There just needs to be a process, a structure, a series of events that are in place that keeps us from doing the same thing, even if it's routine. Do you realize the message that John the Baptist, John the Baptist preached the same message for, for so many, I forgot how many years it was. Get ready for Jesus. Every time he came to the pulpit, he preached the same message. Why? Because that's what he was purpose and called to do was to prepare the way for Jesus. Be consistent, be diligent with the plan that God has given you. Don't put it down. Because he says, you're lazy if you do. If you do, if you put the hammer down, you're lazy. But there's also another term we see in the scripture, and this is found in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. I just want to read that. He said, don't be lazy. He said, don't be foolish. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise Five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, when the vision was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom coming is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there should be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those that were ready went in with them to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterwards, the virgins, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. God says, don't be lazy. Don't be foolish. We're talking about being prepared because all of the ten had the opportunity to be prepared. But there were only five of the ten of these in this particular analogy or parable that were actually prepared. And so what we have to understand, which is the next step after we've allowed our, our, our life and God can see us and have favor and says, I handpick you, we have to have trust and then we have to be obedient. We have to develop a plan. And once we have develop a plan, 
God develops the plan. We prepare. Once the plan is developed, then we operate in consistency. We practice and we implement the plan. Now we must have patience. Patience. All of the ten of these virgins in this particular story have potential. They all have potential. Potential energy, or that stored up energy. All of them were, were capable of having oil. But only five of them, the, the, the uh, wise ones, actually went and bought the oil. So what does that mean? That means that the other five did not understand the value of time. Time is one of the most valuable. You know, we say patience is a virtue, but guess what else? Time is one of the most valuable resources that we can ever have. Time, the more time we prepare, the greater the likelihood of success. Noah was able to have success because he prepared for almost a hundred years. So when we have patience, that means that we know that it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take us a lot of time to achieve our goals. A hundred years or so to do for 40 days. And that's what we have to have when God gives us a plan, when we begin to implement the plan. Now we've got to be consistent but we also have to be patient. And this is the action of just not sitting back, but actually continue to do, converting that potential. All of the virgins had potential. They all had the potential to buy the oil. Only five of them bought the oil. oil. So that means that the other five converted their potential. Guess what, one church, we all have potential. Everyone in the house today has potential. How many of us are going to convert our potential energy into kinetic energy? When we talk about kinetic energy, we talk about energy that is moving. We talk about a process. We talk about the doing. We talk about the movement. And that's the difference between the wise, five, five that were wise and the five that were foolish. Remember, Noah did everything. Amen? The graveyard, I know you've heard this said, the graveyard is full of, of potential. There are so many ideas that are in the grave right now. God trusted them enough to share his plan with them that was bigger than they could ever be. And they took that idea, they took that plan that God gave them to the grave. They never implemented, they never had the patience to work it and put the time in it. They didn't understand how valuable time is. Can, I, can you put my ark back on the screen, please? I want to just look at this ark and look at the size of this ark. When you look at this, you cannot wait to the last minute to build something that large. Noah could not have waited until the last few years to start building that. Noah understood, and this is a term we use in investments, Noah understood the value of time. Do we understand the value of time? In investments, we call it time value of money. That simply means, you nod your head, you understand that means that our money is more valuable in the present than it will be in the future. So that means that I could literally, when I was 18 years old, put away $50 and invest $50 a month and have way more money than if I waited until I'm 50 years old because of time value, that means that now I've got to put away, when I could put away $50 30 years ago, now I've got to put away $5,000 a month because the value of time means that the earlier I start, the earlier that I invest in my plan and what God has called me to do, the more the likelihood of the success that I would have. Time value of money. Are we putting our plan in place today? for something that may not happen for the next 20 years? Are we working on that thing? Are we putting the time? Are we patient enough to know that we can't build an ark overnight? Noah couldn't have waited until the end. That is the definition of what? Procrastination. Procrastination is disobedience. Procrastination, and somebody put it on Facebook, and I just wrote it down. Procrastination is rebellion in slow motion. You might as well call it disobedience. When we wait to do something that God has given us to do, 
Noah didn't wait. Noah began to build. He didn't ask questions. God gave him the plan. He didn't say, well, I'll do that part tomorrow. He obeyed God. Too many times we're saying, I'm praying about it. We ask, there's people I've talked to, and sometimes God will show me to share things with them. And they'll say, well, I'm not, I don't know if I'm not ready to do that right now. I need to keep praying on that. And then a, a few occasions, they've admitted to me that God had already spoken that to them. So what they were doing was procrastinating, but to, just to put it bluntly, what they were doing was being disobedient to what God had asked them to do. Not realizing that we can be wise because when we don't procrastinate, when we do prepare, when we do have the trust that God wants in us, when we do uh, become obedient to what God has asked us to do, when we do implement the plan, when we continue to be consistent and diligent and, 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 and hammer every day, and when we do allow for patience and we do give ourselves the time to get things right so that we're not rushing and putting things together, now guess what? Our preparation can meet this word that we hear all the time called opportunity. Opportunity is waiting to meet preparation. And I think we've been so sorely misunderstood about opportunity. I don't, think, I don't think we truly understand the facet of opportunity. Opportunity, we've discounted opportunity. An old pastor friend of mine used to say, when opportunity comes and we miss it, it's not necessarily obligated to reschedule. So we must prepare ourselves for opportunity. Opportunity, watch this. The bridegroom when did the bridegroom come? The bridegroom came at midnight. Opportunity generally comes at midnight. We expect opportunity to come during the day. We expect opportunity to come when it's opportune for us. Opportunity doesn't come during the day. Opportunity generally comes at midnight. So are we going to be prepared when it comes, the only way to be prepared for opportunity is to allow God to lead our lives, to walk with him. But if we miss opportunity for something that God has been working on in your life for the last 20 years, he's now ready to say, let's go. And some things God, God was working on me about ministry when I was five years old. About seven years ago, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, I want you to start a ministry. So when God taps you on the shoulder and says, let's go. For no, in Noah's case, when he turns the water on, when he turns the sprinklers on. Will our boats be ready? Are we still hammering? And God is saying, no, the water's coming. I warn you, I gave you a hundred or so years to prepare and you've got your family on the line. You've got the future of mankind on the line. And we're acting as if we have time. We act, we're acting as if we have more time. I'm sorry to say this to you, One Church. I've been to more funerals. I've seen more funerals in this day than I have ever can imagine in my lifetime. A friend of ours from Oral Roberts died last week. She was 48 years old. She found out she had cancer two and a half months ago. Time is not promised us to us tomorrow. We don't know how much time we have. We should be diligently, consistently working on our plans. Because when opportunity comes, it's not necessarily obligated to reschedule. Noah builds the ark. The rain come. Forty days it rains. You know the story. I didn't want to read. Seventh chapter talks about the rains. It says again, Noah did everything that God asked him to do. God kept reminding us of how important it is that we do everything that he asked us to do. Everything. And Noah did it. Noah did everything. He didn't cut any corners. It rained and God kept his word. He wiped out everything on the earth. We know the story. Eventually they came out. Noah lived and his family live and all the animal and all the species that he had brought into the boat with him or to the ark with him. 
So what am I saying? After we've allowed God to, to trust us with something precious, with something big, once we become obedient and say, I'm going to obey you, God, even if it doesn't make sense to build an ark when it's never rained, then we implement the plan, then we get consistent, we hammer, then we have the patience and the time to put into it. Some of us need to be working on our craft. God has called you to do something. Are you working on your craft? And if you don't understand everything, are you checking out books out of the library? Back in the day, we used to have the library card, the Dewey Decimal System. We go to the library, we check out books. Right now, you don't have to do that. You can pull it up on your phone right now. But are you working on your craft? For 100 years, Noah was working on his craft, and here he is now. The preparation has paid off because the title of the sermon today is Preparation Pays. So what does that mean? Sometimes it does come in dollars because when we do what God asks us to do, a lot of what we want in life is tied into our money. Your money is tied into your purpose. For me, I'm a financial advisor. I get to help people to solve their financial challenges. And so I'm compensated for that. A lot of what God has called us to do, and we're chasing the dollar, we're chasing the money. Guess what? Preparation does pay in dollars. When we're prepared to do things, we were talking about this this weekend. There are some Michael Jordans, there are some Kobe Bryant's that never made it out of Rucker Park. What was the difference between the guy that was more talented than Kobe Bryant? Preparation was the difference between that guy that had more talent than Kobe. There are some people that are more talented than we are. Preparation and aligning ourselves with God. Michael talked about it. He said there were people that were better than him. But he worked. He was prepared for that one opportunity he got. And he sees the opportunity just like Noah did. So now we see not only does preparation pays in dollars, but more importantly, preparation pays in my last slide is in legacy. Every day, I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you all. Every day when I wake up, I'm thinking about my children, and I'm thinking about my children's children. Realizing, watch this, and you all can stand. You just give me a little soft music so we can realize and watch this. My obedience, just like Noah, my doing exactly what God has asked me to do is determined in how successful my children are. Pastor Bell so eloquently talked about the sons of Corey last week. He talked about how to break generational curses. You want to you wanna know how to start? And he talked about how to start a generational blessing. It's being obedient to God. This is how we start a generation. This is what Noah did. Noah created an entire new generation that started with him because of his obedience. He built legacy and he saved humanity. He saved humanity because first God could trust him. Can God trust us? Are we trustworthy? There are some people that I wouldn't leave my wallet around. I'm being honest with you. There are some people that I would, when you go to the store, do you just leave your car door open and the keys in there? No, because everybody's not trustworthy. Are we trustworthy? It doesn't mean you're going to steal my car, but can God trust you with his vision? Can you be trusted? Let me say it this way to you. Can the body of Christ be trusted with the gift that God has given you? Are we going to be consistent? Or are we going to check in and check out? Because we must be hammering every day. I'm talking to one church now, and I'm not even just talking to you individually. One church needs to prepare itself in the summer for something God has for us in the winter. And this ministry needs consistency. Even in things that we can't see right now, there are things that God is preparing us for. And some of the things we don't understand that we're doing, God is setting us up. And what we must do as a body of Christ is be faithful and be obedient and to be trustworthy. But can God trust you with his plan? Can God trust us with something big? 
And if he decides that, you know what, I'm going to tap one church on the shoulder. Can he trust us to do like Noah did? The Bible says Noah did everything. Everything is God commanded. Can God trust us in your personal lives? And can he trust this ministry that we're going to do everything? Or are we just going to do those things that are convenient? When it gets tough, when it gets challenging, when we want to sleep and do other things that we want to do, we just say, you know what? Not today. Can God trust us with his vision? Can he trust us with his plan? Can he trust us to be consistent? Can he trust us to clock in every day and hammer? Can he trust us to be patient? And to, and, and to, to if you got something big to do, and Pastor Bell helps me with this, because sometimes I want to wait, do things later. He's like, no, Pastor Rod, we got to do this now. We got to do this in this step. We got to do this in this step. So that when we get closer to the end, we're not necessarily having so much to do that's overwhelming. Can God trust us with his process is what I'm asking you. Just like Noah, he could trust Noah with his process. And now can God trust us if he wakes us up at midnight and gives us this opportunity? Can he trust us that we'll be ready? This wasn't a shouting message. This was a teaching message. Noah taught us one man. One person changed humanity. God was prepared to wipe us all out. It only took one person's obedience. And because of the man's obedience, he was able to save his family. How many of us say, God, I'll be obedient? I'll do what you ask me to do, even if I don't understand it. Let me say this to you, because I know we'll do things sometimes that don't make sense. Sometimes our challenge is just doing things we don't want to do. Sometimes we just have a challenge because in this society we live in now, it's just made it convenient for us just to do us. And this scripture reminds me that I'm always going to be challenged. This Bible that I read always reminds me that I'm going to be inconvenienced and I have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. How many of us say, God, I'm going to allow you to, to, allow you to work in my life even if it creates discomfort? Let me, if, you, if you're not ready to raise your hand, don't raise it. Because what you're saying is, God, that you can trust me. You're saying that you're going to be righteous, that you're going to be blameless, that you're going to walk with God. You can't say this with your mouth. See, believing is not saying. Believing is doing. We can say You can say what you want to me today, but are, are you willing to do? And that's what Noah showed. Noah said, God, I'll obey you. But his obedience was shown in his actions. We all raise our hands to do things, but when it's time to, to implement, it's a different story. So I'm asking us today to be prepared. Preparation does pay. Right now, we're living out, living out the legacy, not only our lives, but the lives of our children and the lives of our children's children. You're doing exactly today what you planned to do. You're doing exactly today what you prepared to do. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. Let's get a little closer to God so he can readjust our plans and so that we can build a legacy that goes from our children and our children's children. Amen. Is there anyone here says, you know what, Pastor? I just want the opportunity to know Christ. Or you say, with everybody's eyes closed and everybody's head bowed, I want you just to, I want to just agree with you. If you say, and just be honest, I don't really understand the plan that God has for my life. I don't really, and that's okay. It's okay. We serve a God that when we ask questions, he gives us answers. Sometimes the answer is no. When we're not ready or when, when it's not him, he says no. When it's not time, he says slow, 
slow down when it when he has it for a, a different season and when it, we're ready and when it's our season then he says go sometimes he says no sometimes he says slow sometimes he says go and wherever you are God, right now, I thank you for clarity for your believers. Because apparently we've all said yes, that we would obey you, God. So now, God, as you prepare us by giving us your plan design, God, we pray right now for clarity for those that raise their hands. And we pray also, God, that for those that need clarity, that they even just begin to seek you out for a close, just a little bit closer relationship with you, God. Just, God, you, you said you can come a little closer. And we all can afford just to come a little closer to you, God. So that we can be like Noah and walk faithfully with you. God, give us a desire to walk a little bit more faithfully with you, God. Why? So that you can provide clarity, God. So that we know exactly what we're doing is where you want us to be, God. We thank you for this example in the Bible of Noah who wasn't necessarily perfect, God. Because we saw later that Noah got drunk and, you know, he made mistakes. But the Bible still says that he was blameless because he sought your heart. And so, God, we seek your heart right now. We seek your plan right now, God, and we say, yes, we'll be committed to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You all, uh, um, we just thank you all. I want to just say I wasn't here last week, but I wanted to say thank you for, for you all that came out for our food distribution. Uh, it was awesome. Pastor said it was just a, a glorious day where we were able to be who God has called us to be in our community. And so I wanted to say thank you on behalf of our missions team. We, we celebrate you. And uh, there's more to come. There's more things that God has for us. As he's preparing us to do ministry on a larger scale. Let's make sure that we're in place as the body of Christ. Let's make sure that our gifts are available for those who need it. Because when we're obedient, the body of Christ benefits. Not just your family, but the body of Christ. So I thank God for us there. Um, are there any announcements? You come. Let's say amen for our minister in training. As she comes, you can just close us out. Can we get the Lord? Thank you for worshiping with us today. And we thank you for donating to One Church ATL through our giving. We look forward to seeing you here next Sunday at 10 a.m. in person at our Marietta location or right here on our social media page. We love you and look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Thank you for tuning in to our live One Church ATL broadcast. One Church ATL continues to be actively involved with spreading the gospel and impacting lives in our local community. Because of your continued financial support, we've been able to support our first responders and agencies directly involved with supplying resources to those in need. Our ministry has partnered with food distribution centers to assist with the immediate needs of our community, and we've been able to address needs right here within the body of Christ. Your continued support is appreciated as we spread the gospel of the kingdom through giving. On behalf of One Church ATL, we want to say thank you for giving. We pray your resources continue to be blessed.